In this video, we're going to see what root locus with repeated poles at the origin is like. Let's assume that you've got an open loop transfer function with one zero at s plus a, a repeated pole at the origin, s squared, and poles at s plus b and s plus c. Without knowing those exact values, we don't know where exactly the zero and the poles will fall, but we do know that there's a repeated pole at the origin. So the question, and especially if you're doing this as a root locus problem where you'd like to understand how the departure angles are, is what do you do about those repeated poles at s squared? We know from the root locus steps that the points in between any values where there's an odd number of poles or zeros to the right are found on the real axis. So you can begin to sketch that between the two poles that are not at the origin, that you'll see root locus on the real axis there, and you'll also see a section of the root locus to the left of the zero. You know that there'll be breakaway points there by intuition, but we're not gonna cover calculating those breakaway points today. There also will always be a breakaway point at s equals zero, regardless of the values that you pick for a, b, and c. And the reason for that is that if you invert g, o of l, and take its maximum or minimum, you'll always end up with its derivative having an s term in the numerator that's unaccounted for elsewhere. So there will always be a term at s equals zero where the function is minimized. You know that whenever you're looking for the angles for the breakaway points, that the approach is to place a pole epsilon close to either the start or the ending, and then check to see where angles equal 180 degrees. The question for the repeated pole is, how does that work? I mean, I can choose a point very nearby, a little bit up, a little bit to the right. What are my different options there? So let's zoom in on this little square here at the origin and look at a couple of different options that you might choose and what the results of those options will be. Let's say here that we've chosen to place the pole just a little bit above, still on the j omega axis. We know that we'll always have a conjugate pair of poles. So the other pole will be at plus or minus, uh, one of the poles will be at j omega, the other pole will be at minus j omega. So this is option one. Option two is to leave the first pole where it is at the origin and place the second pole negative omega to the left. So if you move the, one of the poles just a little bit to the left, how will this affect it? So that's option two. Using the logic that you have about placing the root locus on any point where there is an odd number of poles or zeros to the right, we know that if you move negative epsilon to the left, as in option two, you're going to get a root locus portion here, and that the breakaway is going to send these poles and zeros, or these poles, off at 90 degrees whenever the breakaway happens. So one of the intuitions that you should have here is that even if you choose it just a little bit to the left, your angle of departure may be zero degrees or minus 180 degrees, but as soon as it departs, it's going to take off from the breakaway point. Let's check the other example. And in fact, both of these examples by labeling our poles uh, P1, P2, P3, P4, and our zero Z1. In order to calculate the angles of a part departure or arrival, we take the sum of the zeros minus the sum of the poles, and or the zeros minus the poles, I should say, and compare those values whether they're equal to plus or minus 180 degrees. In our case, we have one zero and four poles, so one, two, three, four. Uh, angle of Z, zero one minus angle of pole one minus angle of pole two, angle of pole three. The values for zero one, angle, angle pole one, and angle pole two will all be zero because they're all on the real axis. And if your epsilon is small enough, you're still going to end up with a value of zero. We're left then with minus P3 minus the angle of P3 minus the angle of P4 is equal to plus or minus 180 degrees. Let's look at the two examples that we have in this exact formalism to make sure that we're getting the answers we expect. In option one, let's say that angle P4 is la as labeled here, and that angle P4 will be 90 degrees if we've chosen to have our offset in J omega, or in, in J epsilon on the J omega axis. So the angle of departure and arrival should then be minus P3 minus angle P4 plus or equals plus or minus 180. Substituting angle P4 of 90 degrees here gives us an angle of P3 equals to 90 degrees. So we should expect that for the top pole, the value that's at uh, zero plus j epsilon, that we should see it take off up towards the j omega axis. Likewise here, for angle P4, if we chose this setup, we would end up with angle P4 equals to 180 degrees. 
So substituting that value for angle P4, we're left then with the angle of P3 equals to zero. That matches what we see from the distinct label that you would give from looking just at the segments of the real axis with an odd number of poles or zeros to the right. And it's nice to know that we get the same answer here. But again, the breakaway is gonna tell you that it's gonna shoot off up and down. So even if it's departing at zero degrees when it leaves there, it's gonna immediately go to 90 degrees. So I think the last portion of this that you should think of, because of that breakaway point, we're going to see that the takeoff in these cases is plus or minus 90 degrees. So the departure that you'll see, regardless of where you place epsilon, is 90 degrees, but it can be for different reasons.